Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I am Professor Shiladitya Rakshit. It's module 27. It is known as the International Labour Organization or ILO. Now, what is the International Labour Organization? Is a question which must have cropped in all of your minds. What are the organizations? What are the basics? And how do we approach the International Labour Organization? The International Labour Organization or ILO is a United Nations specialized agency and is responsible for coordinating labour related activities within the UN system. Its objective is to promote social justice and international peace by ensuring decent work and safe as well as adequate employment conditions for all people, whether man or woman. The ILO works to improve global labor standards as well as employment. These employment opportunities are on behalf of its 185 member states. It has designed four strategic objectives for its work in pursuit of these objectives. Firstly, is to promote and realize standards and fundamental principles and rights at work. Second, to create great opportunities for women and men to decent employment as well as to earn a basic degree of income. Also, to enhance the coverage and effectiveness of social protection for all. It also tries to strengthen tripartitism and social dialogue in pursuit of these goals. The ILO engages in a variety of activities. It works to create international labor standards, promote them, and supervise their application. So these are the basic standards. It also sets out international policies for promoting human rights, improving working conditions, and expanding employment opportunities to all and the many concerned. It offers technical assistance to countries to help them implement the ILO standards and programs. It sets out international policies for promoting human rights, improving working conditions and expanding employment. Apart from that, it offers technical assistance to countries to help them implement, most importantly, ILO standards and programs which are there to promote the safety and security of people working in various conditions. It also engages in training, education, and research on labor and employment issues. Apart from this, the ILO is a prolific lawmaker having promulgated 189 international labor conventions, six protocols and 203 recommendations on various matters of concern. It is also a major source of labor. Statistics, for example, covering various aspects of employment in over 
200 countries this 200 countries covers areas in various parts of the globe now what is the history it is to be seen that labor and employment have long been concerns of the international community and international action on this front dates back to the 1800s that is in the 19th century industrialist robert owen who coined the slogan and my students will take it at the pinch of humor 8 hours of labor 8 hours of recreation and 8 hours of rest i am quote for example began advocating for international action on labor conditions as early as 1816 now when he brought his proposals to the vienna peace conference it was seen that the first international organization was created for the purpose of expanding labor protection and this labor protection was known or was coined as the international application association for labor legislation iall founded in basel switzerland in 1900 most importantly the iaal was not an intergovernmental organization but rather was a voluntary body composed of sections with representatives of labor organizations reformers economists and members of national ministries of labor and others the iall's aims were to facilitate the study of and provide information regarding labor legislation firstly to promote international agreements on labor and workers to ensure and take steps for their protection and to establish an international system of statistics and most importantly to organize an international labor office this international labor office was to serve as a center for these functions the association created the original international labor office at its first meeting in basel now this was way back in 1901 the association and office were both equally responsible for the creation of two international it covers mostly the european sector conventions on labor issues one regulating the night work for women and most importantly the white phosphorus convention of 1906 this was a giant leap because it prohibited the manufacturing of matches using white phosphorus a substance that was extremely hazardous and dangerous to the health of workers working in match factories the responsibilities of the international labor office were taken over by the international labor organization now how did it come into place in ilo when it came into being after the first world war and it was only after the first world war that the ilo germined in 1990 this was nothing but an agency of the league of nations it was created as part 13 labor 
of the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, or the First World War in other words. The inclusion of labour in the Treaty of Versailles is highly symbolic. The question arises why? Because it demonstrates the view that peace and labour coexist side by side and the rights arising from both were inextricably linked. As the preamble to the ILO constitution puts it, university and lasting peace can be established only if it is based upon social justice. The social justice is the foundation of universal and lasting peace. The ILO's constitution was drafted by a commission chaired by then head of the American Federation of Labour. His name was Samuel Gompers. He did this in association with representatives from Belgium, Cuba, Czechoslovakia, France, Italy, Japan, Poland, the UK and the United States that the ILO became a specialized agency of the UN in 1946. In 1969, because of its tremendous work in the field of labor and employment, the ILO received the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, what is the institution? Let us understand the gamut of it. The ILO is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. It also maintains a number of field offices throughout the world. The organization has a unique tripartite structure. Now, what is the tripartite structure? It brings together representatives of its 185 member governments, employers, and workers in its executive bodies. The ILO is composed of three bodies to be noted. A general conference of representatives of the members. It is the first part, a governing body and an international labor office. The general conference, to be noted, meets once in a year in June and that is the time when people come together, is basically composed of four representatives from each member state, two government delegates, one delegate representing, in most as the case may be, the interests of employers and one delegate representing as you all have all understood by now the interests of workers. So therefore to strike equal chord and balance. The general conference is responsible for adopting recommendations and conventions Apart from that, it decides its work program, policy and budget. The governing body, which is the next portion of the ILO, consists of 56 members elected to three-year terms, 28 representing governments, including 10 to be held by nations of chief industrial importance. Apart from that, there are 14 representing employers' interests and 14 representing workers' interests. So everyone has equal share of participation. Its tasks, one may ask, includes setting the agenda for the general conference, adopting the draft ILO budget 
for submission to the general conference and supervising the functions of the international labor organization as well as its offices in various parts of the world the international labor office is something to be taken note of it carries out the daily tasks of the ilo it is headed by a director general who is appointed by the governing body the tenure is for a 5 year term the ilo's current director general is guy rider who began his term in october of 2012 apart from the officers and the dg's office there's a committee of experts which was established in 1926 it is composed of independent jurists they are responsible for monitoring and reporting on the implementation of ilo now having said about the role of the dg and the role of the io what is the role of ilo as instrument of human rights a number of human rights relevant to the protection of labor because labor is very effective including the rights to freedom from slavery and servitude freedom to form associations non discrimination the right to work and the right to leisure now all this are important this is summed up in article 4 of the universal declaration of human rights which states i quote that no one shall be held in slavery or servitude slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms article 20 states that again i quote that everyone has a right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association no one may be compelled to belong to an association article 23 also brings into light by stating that everyone irrespective of his caste creed or religion or race has the right to work to free choice of employment to just and favorable conditions of work and to protection against unemployment everyone without any discrimination it is said in clause 2 has a right to equal pay for equal work it also goes on further to states that everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration ensuring for himself and his family and existence which is worthy of human dignity and existence and not mere uh, right to life and this can be supplemented if necessary by other means of social protection that everyone has a right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of his interests as well as of his rights article 24 states and which very clearly lays down that everyone has the right to rest and leisure now what is this right to rest and leisure people may be wondering it includes reasonable limitation of working hours and periodic holidays with pay the codification most importantly of international human rights law into this binding international covenant on civil 
and Political Rights, ICCPR, an international covenant on economic as well as social and cultural rights, which in other words is known as or abbreviated ICESCR, both have an important bearing on this module on ILO. It brought with it a separation of these rights into two groups, civil and political labor rights. These are protected by the ICCPR under which Article 8 clearly states that, and like any other article promoting human rights, that no one shall be held in slavery. Slavery and slave trade in all their forms shall or must be prohibited. It goes on to further say that because of labor, no one shall be held in servitude, that no one shall be required to perform forced or compulsory labor. Article 22 of the ILO says that everyone shall have the right to freedom and this freedom shall in entail association with others including the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of his or her own basic rights it will cater to interests as well meanwhile economic Social and cultural labor rights are protected under the ICESCR, the abbreviation of which, which I told before, according to which Article 6 states, the state parties, so now from the individuals we come to the states, the state parties for the present government recognize the right to work. It is a very important right, which includes the right of everyone to the opportunity to gain and access to work and to earn a living which he freely chooses. And the government shall take appropriate steps to safeguard this right. Now the question arises that what are the steps which are there to be taken? The steps to be taken by a state party to the present government to achieve the full realization of this right are as follows. It shall include technical and vocational guidance and training, programs, policies and techniques, element of three. And why are these to be given? To achieve steady economic, social and cultural development. And at the same time, full and productive employment under conditions safeguarding fundamental political and economic catering to the individual. Article 7, that the state parties of the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to the enjoyment of just and favorable conditions of work which ensure in particular, number one, remuneration which provides all workers as a minimum with fair wages and remuneration for work of equal value without distinction or discrimination of any kind. In particular, women being guaranteed conditions of work and that she may not be made feel inferior to those enjoyed by men. This can be achieved 
by the famous motto of equal pay for equal work. Also to ensure both male and female workers a decent living for themselves and their families in accordance with the provisions of the present government. Safe and healthy working conditions are also important and equal opportunity for everyone to be promoted in his employment areas and this promotion should be at an appropriate higher level. Now this should not be subjected to considerations other than those of seniority and competence. Rest, leisure and reasonable limitations point four or working hours and periodic holidays with pay as well as other benefits in the form of remuneration for public holidays is a sine qua non of the conventions on the governance articles laid down by the island. Article 8 states the state parties of the present covenant undertake to ensure a the right of everyone to form trade unions and joining the trade union of his choice he shall not be forced or coerced into it. Now subject only to the rules of the organization concerned for the promotion and protection of his or her interest as well as the interests which are both economic and social. No restrictions in any capacity may be placed on exercise of this right other than those which are prescribed by law or procedure established by law and which are necessary in a democratic society in the interests of national security or public order or for the most important for the protection of the rights and freedoms of the general public at large. Clause B states the right of trade unions to establish national federations or confederations and the rights of the latter to form which is important or join international trade has to be guided by certain factors. The right of trade unions to functions freely subject to no limitations other than those which are prescribed by law and which the government imposes on time to times which are necessary in any living, vivid and a democratic society interests of national security or public order. Or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of the general public as such. The right to strike is also accepted provided that it is exercised in conformity with the laws of the particular country. The result of this splitting of rights is important, has been an uneven level of implementation and enforcement as such that the civil component and the political component contained in the ICCPR that is non-discrimination, freedom association and various other freedoms from forced labour etc etc have received a greater degree of protection in various parts of the world. This compared to the economic, social, cultural rights contained 
in the ICE SCR, that is right to work, right to adequate working conditions, right to leisure, right to strike, etc., etc., which have received much, much lesser protection, almost no protection at all in certain countries. Additional protections are included in many international and regional instruments, including the major UN treaties, which finds mention of these rights time and again. The European Convention on Human Rights, for example, also finds mention. The African Convention on Human Rights and People's Rights, etc. And many, many others. It is also important of approaching labour through the lens of rights is important because it frames things like the ability to strike, a fair minimum wage, freedom association and non-discrimination as important legal entitlements rather than as an aid or charity. It is to be noted, very important, that all UN entities must abide by the UN Charter, which establishes human rights as a major institutional goal. It states, and I quote, which is very solemn, that we the peoples of the United Nations determined to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in equal rights of men and women and of nations. So this quote is so sacrosanct, it summarizes the entire work of the ILO. In this context, the ILO's work in producing labour conventions, offering technical assistance to improve employment, opportunities and conditions and setting human rights standards for work contribute directly to each and every person. Here, each and every person's right to adequate work, freedom from forced labour and safe and healthy environments and working conditions of employment are guaranteed to and adhered. Human rights to be kept in mind are explicitly included in the operations mandate as set out in the Declaration of the Philadelphia Conference. Article 1 of the document asserts that freedom and freedom of expression, which is most important, and of association are essential to sustained progress and Article 2 maintains most importantly, that all human beings, rich or poor, irrespective of race, creed or sex, have the right to pursue both their material well-being as well as their spiritual well-being and development of the health, etc. etc. Now this pursuit must be in conditions of freedom, dignity, of economic security and equal opportunity. Article 3 sets out a list of human rights which are as follows and which provides relevant goals of the United ILO including full employment and raising of standards of living. Recognition of the right of collective bargaining is also important 
because it's an extension of the social security measures these social security measures provide a basic income to all in need of such protection and well as comprehensive medical treatment to healthcare as well as adequate protection for the life and health of workers there is a provision for child welfare and maternity benefits because both the mother and the child has to be protected the provision of adequate nutrition housing and facilities for recreation are essential and it is most important to note the assurance of equality of educational and well as vocational guidance is a primary responsibility of state governments and opportunity has to be granted the 1998 ilo declaration on the fundamental principles and rights at work provided these basic rights to members of the ilo as well as to other citizens etc etc although the ilo has come on criticism because it is not necessary that these principles have been implemented in practice the scope of labor rights have shrunk over the time employers have done their own bit in giving and catering to a minority section of laborers still it aims to provide adequate safeguards and strives and ensures to provide a clean environment and prevents discrimination to all men and women across the world as far as labor conditions are concerned in order to summarize it is to be noted that the ilo was a part and parcel of the treaty of versailles before that in the 18th century there was a person who had brought about this concept of a labor organization looking to rights of laborers especially in this phosphorus factories which were mainly manufacturing watches and now the ilo despite its oddities despite the fact of the various economic conditions has tried to provide a safe and a clean environment for workers to make sure that no one is discriminated at the same time people are allowed to choose their livelihood thank you